the epistle for this third Sunday after Epiphany is taken from St. Paul to the Romans, chapter 12. Brethren, be not wise in your own conceits. Show no man render evil for evil, providing good things not only in the right in the sight of God, but also in the sight of men. If it be possible, as much as it is in you, having peace with all men, revenge not yourselves, my dearly beloved, but give place unto wrath. For it is written, Revenge is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. But if the enemy, hung, enemy be hungry, give him to eat. If he thirst, give him to drink. For doing this, thou shalt eat coals of fire upon his head. Be not overcome by evil, but overcome evil by good. And then, and then the gospel. Take metaphor to St. Matthew chapter 8. At that time, when Jesus was come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, a leper came and adored him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus, stretching forth his hand, touched him, saying, I will, be thou made clean. And forthwith his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, See thou tell no man, but go show thyself to the priest, and offer the gift which Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. And when he had entered the Capernaum, there came to him a centurion, beseeching him, and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home, sick of the palsy, and is grievously tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. And the centurion making answer said, Lord, I am not worthy, and thou shouldst enter under my roof. But only say the word, and my servant shall be healed. For I also am a man subject to authority, having under me soldiers. And I say to this man, Go, and he goeth, and to that man, to another, come, and he cometh. And to my servant, Do this, and he doth it. And Jesus, hearing this, marveled, and said to them that followed him, Amen, I say to you, I have not found so great a faith in Israel. And I say to you that many shall come from the east and from the west, and shall sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. For the children of the kingdom shall be cast into the exterior darkness, where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said to the centurion, Go, and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And the servant was healed at that same hour. Thus far the words of today's holy gospel. <laughs> On this on the Holy Ghost, amen. Today is the first, the third Sunday after Epiphany. Today, a consideration not on the Epistle and Gospel, but on the scripture reading of today, which is saying in St. Paul's letter to the Galatians, <coughs> part of the scripture we very often quote in the whole battle tradition down the last 50 years since Vatican II, and St. Athanasius quoted it many, many times in his time. And in every other time of the age of error and heresy of the church, this has been quoted. But it's in the epistle, not the epistle reading, of the scripture reading of the Holy Breviary this morning, which is taken from the Gospel from the St. Paul of the Galatians, chapter 1. So we'll read the passage that we read in the Breviary this morning. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ, and, the, and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all, and all the brethren who are with me to the, to the churches of Galatia. Grace be to you, and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who, who, have, who gave himself uh, for our sins, that, we, that he might deliver us from this present wicked world, according to the will of God and our Father, to whom is glory forever and ever. Amen. I wonder that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, only there were some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach a gospel to you besides that which we have preached unto you, let him be anathema. As we said before, so now I say again, if anyone preach you a gospel, Besides that which you have received, let him be anathema. For do I now persuade men of God, or do I seek to please men? If I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. 
For I give you to understand, brethren, that the gospel which was preached to me is not according to man. For neither did I receive it of man, nor did I learn it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard my conversation in the time of past of the Jews' religion, and how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. And I made progress in the Jews' religion, above many of my equals in my own nation, being more abundantly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased him, who separated me from my mother's womb, and called me by his grace, to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles, immediately I condescended not to the flesh and blood. So the middle part of this reading is often quoted by the saints. And here we say that St. Paul writes to the Galatians. And he says, well, greetings in Galatia, in, in Galatia. How is it that so soon you are removed from the church of Christ? How did it happen that so soon you might just preach to you, you just received the gospel, you just got the faith, and that, uh, and that which, and, and that, and yet I wonder that you are so soon removed from Him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel which is not another gospel. Only there are some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel of heaven preach a gospel to you besides that which we have already preached to you, let him be anathema. As we said before, so now I say again, if anyone preached to you a gospel besides that which you have received, let him be anathema. Well, it is said twice in this famous passage. If we ourselves, or an angel from heaven, that's on the subjective side, if we ourselves, or an angel from heaven, preach a gospel different from the one that we already preach to you, let it be anathema. So you must hear from me the same gospel you heard before. So you look at the authority of the church, and you look at the authority of the church, and you see that popes and bishops and saints, they have preached the gospel, and they have preached the gospel, and they have preached the gospel. But they are they preaching the same gospel that they preached before? Hence, in the first half verse, St. Paul says, I say to you, if we ourselves, that is St. Paul, or an angel from heaven, or any of the twelve apostles, or an angel from heaven, which means bishops of the church, teach you another gospel than one you have already received, let it be an anathema. Now he makes it clear, because if you hear that passage by itself, you might think that this passage refers to those, say, go and worship Buddha, go and worship the trees, uh, go and worship the, the whatever other false god, go and join another religion, go become some kind of false religion. But St. Paul makes it clear he's not talking about the pagans. He's not talking about all the non-Catholic religions. He's talking about Catholics. That there will come Catholics, priests and bishops, who will say another gospel than the gospel that they said before. So even though I am a, a, a bishop of the church, a priest of the church, and I am an individual man, was only born a few years ago, and will die soon after today. I am not, when I speak in the pulpit, I'm not speaking as me as a person. I'm speaking as a priest of the church. So therefore, when St. Paul says, if the priest stands in the pulpit, doesn't matter if he's 24 years old, it's his first sermon. Doesn't matter if he's 99 years old, and it's 400,000 sermon. Is that 24-year-old priest who's up there preaching his first sermon, is he preaching the same gospel you heard from the priest before? Because even though he's a new priest, and today is his first sermon, he is not preaching his first sermon. He, as a priest of God, is communicating the words that all priests of God have communicated for 2,000 years. And though you might be 90, and he might be 24, you expect to hear that this sermon that he is giving, that this preaching that he is giving, is the same as what you heard before from him. Because every priest that stands in the pulpit, and every priest that preaches the word of God, is saying a word that was preached before. And who are the first preachers of this word? They are the twelve apostles. 
These are the first preachers of this word. And St. Paul says, I came to you. And he is the 13th apostle, the one born out of due time, and a true apostle because he's trained by Jesus Christ at the very end of the, this chapter 1. St. Paul says, I only met St. Peter once in my life, spent 15 days with him. We were good friends for those 15 days. I met James, the apostle, once. I never laid eyes on any of the other ten apostles. I never saw them ever in my life. That's what St. Paul says in the chapter 1 of the Galatians. But I spent three years in the desert, and I received the gospel out of due time, and I did not receive any teaching from Peter. We talked about the weather, we talked about the sports, we talked about all kinds of things during those 15 days. We talked about souls. I did not learn the gospel of Jesus Christ from 15 days with St. Peter. I learned it directly from Jesus Christ himself, for I am an apostle born out of due time. He spent three years in the desert with Jesus Christ. The apostle spent three years traveling, three years with Christ also. And St. Paul spent three years with Christ, but it was only one-on-one. -on -one. He learned directly from Jesus Christ. And he says, and I, and the Holy Ghost knows that I do not lie. He says this at the end of chapter 1. He is an apostle, St. Paul. He received his information directly from Jesus Christ. And he came with fresh knowledge to Galatia after having spoken to Christ. Because Christ did not speak to the Galatians. Christ wanted St. Paul to speak to the Galatians. And to communicate the gospel of Christ through the apostles. And the apostles communicated that gospel. And so soon has it been removed from you. And St. Paul explains how it was removed. The Galatians did not lose their faith because they just went back to paganism, which they were pagans before. They didn't lose their faith because they decided to just be impure and go back to the life of sin. They lost their faith because preachers who were called the followers of Christ came to them. And they preached another gospel. And to make it clear that they were also Catholics, St. Paul says... I wonder that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ into another gospel, which is not another gospel. In other words, it's not the teaching of the paganism you had before, or another, or another form of paganism. But only there are some that trouble you who would pervert the gospel of Christ. What is Vatican II? What are these modern Catholic bishops? What are the modern Catholic priests? What are those who teach anything other, including the Sandemicartists and the false conservative movements? What are they doing? They're teaching something other than what we were already taught before. Is it better? Is it wiser? Maybe it is. But it's other than what we were taught before. Therefore, let them be anathema. As Father McDonald says concerning the error of St. Evicondism, today is just read very brief from the very beginning before beginning the sermon. St. Evicondism is another Vatican II novelty. There are many Vatican II novelties that never happened in the church before. One of them is that there is no Pope, that he looks like a Pope, that he stands in the place of the Pope, but he's not the Pope. And that we have a time of no Pope. We never had such a time in the last 2,000 years. In the Old Testament, the Jews were always provided with prophets and representatives of God, all the way back to Adam. Now, all of a sudden, we have a time in which there is no prophet, a time in which there is no king, a time in which there is no pope, for the first time in ever history. It's a Vatican II novelty. It's just another error of the council. That's all it is. Today is a good example. A few days ago, uh, Joe Biden became the President of the United States on January the 20th. He was invalidly elected. Now many say to be kind of point out the Pope was invalidly elected. Well, maybe he was. Maybe they did put a gun to Cardinal Siri's head. And maybe they did threaten him with death. Maybe they did decide to make the, 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 the Roncalli, the Mason, the Pope in his stead. 
We know they have Dominion software. We know they, they made fake votes for Biden. We know that there was a, there was, he was not elected president. But guess what? Today is January 24th, and for the last four days, Joe Biden is the president of the United States. And when Good Friday comes in a few months, we'll have the solemn collects. And in those solemn collects, I will say, Oremos pro Joe. I will pray for Joe Biden. Because as the President of the United States, he is the representative of God. Remember, we have had martyrs in our church for the last 2,000 years. 2,000 years. One good example is Margaret Clitheroe, who was a mother that died. Her husband was away. She held, she, she held and she hid the priest. She got found out. She was killed along with a little baby in her womb. So the two martyrs, her and the baby in her womb, were martyrs. And they said, you are not a faithful servant of the Queen Elizabeth, one of the most wicked queens in human history, more wicked than Joe Biden. He's just as nothing. He's, a, he's like a jello that somehow got put in the presidency. But, but Elizabeth was really wicked. She was genuine servant of Satan. She was the real deal. She was a hundred times more wicked than Joe Biden. And Elizabeth, they said, they said to Margaret, we're putting you to death because you are not a good servant of the queen. And she said, no, that is not true. I am the most faithful servant of the queen. I would never do anything to harm the queen, nor anything to go against any of her legitimate laws. I just will not turn my back on God, and I will not turn my back on the church, and I put God over the queen. But I would never wish any harm upon her, and I would never do anything against her, because she is the queen who has power given to her by God and from God. Joe Biden does not receive power from the people. Anybody any doubts? The last election makes that very clear. The people didn't vote for him, but he has power. He also does not have authority from the people, nor does his authority come from the scumbags who put him in authority, put him in, in the chair in which he is. His authority comes from God. And as authority coming from God, he has a free will, which he can use that authority well, or he can use it wickedly. He chooses to use it most wickedly. But he is the president of the United States. He is a wicked one, but he is the president. And so we have a situation here that in the Holy Church, we have a wicked pope. He is a wicked pope, Pope Francis. But he is the Holy Father. He stands in the place of God. He has the authority from God. He is just simply wicked. And the Pope, therefore, must be prayed for as the Holy Father. And we have to pray for his conversion. The Blessed Virgin Mary says, when the Pope converts, when the Pope turns back to God, he will consecrate Russia to the heart of Mary. We have had wicked leaders throughout all history. The majority of martyrs are put to death by the leaders of Rome, the emperors and the kings. They are put to death, and we are now heading into a time where the leaders of the United States are going to put Catholics to death. The leaders of the United States are going to put Catholics in prison. They are going to declare the United States that, that, the, that the Catholic religion is illegal and is called domestic terrorism. They are going to accuse Catholics of being the enemies of the state. Is that something new? Read in the time of the Romans. What did the Emperor Nero say? What did Diocletian say? What did Commodus say? What did all the wicked Roman emperors say? They said, we have nothing against the Catholic and Christian religion. We have nothing against popes and bishops and priests and faithful. They are simply bad citizens. They are cannibals. They are domestic terrorists. They are a danger and menace to our society. They are a threat to everything we stand for, and therefore we must eradicate all Catholics. And so they killed 20 million of us, 
in the first 300 years. Our country is ruled by a wicked president. Our church is ruled by a wicked pope. Our diocese is ruled by a wicked bishop. Our parishes are ruled by wicked priests. Our families are ruled by wicked fathers. Our children are ruled by wicked mothers and fathers. And the children are wicked. This is the world in which we live. In this world there can still be the salvation of souls. In this world there can, this truth still have its victory. This is not the first time that the whole of society has turned against God. God's grace and God's powerful movements will make it possible to remove this wickedness from the family, from the city, from the church, from the state. But it will come from heaven, the victory, and not from earth. The democratic system will not defeat Joe Biden. And ecumenism and working together without faith will not defeat Pope Francis and the modernists in the church. And this is the point made here today in Galatians chapter 1. Are you hearing a different gospel than the one that I have already preached to? Have there been more wicked, have there been greatly wicked popes? Yes, there have. Have there been greatly wicked kings? Yes, there have. Many times throughout all of our history. But the Catholic faith's truth and the Catholic faith's goodness defeats all those things. So St. Paul says the first side. Which is, if you hear a gospel preached to you, Besides that which we have already preached you, let him be anathema. Which means forget, condemn all the things that he says and does. Let him be anathema to you. But it doesn't change what he is. We have had wicked popes, wicked bishops, and wicked priests. But we don't listen to another gospel. Then he says the second time, which is the, which is the, which is the side of the recipient, repeating, As we said before, so now I say again, if anyone preach you a gospel besides that which you have already received, let him be anathema. If you receive a gospel that is different than what you have already received, and here the saints emphasize concerning this passage, how can you know you've received a different gospel if you don't know your catechism? How can you know that you are hearing a lie if you don't know the truth? That is why 113 or 14 years ago, St. Pius X said in Pesceni Dominici Gracious and also in other places in his teaching, the reason why heresy spreads is because Catholics don't know the gospel that they've received. So if you don't know the gospel you have received, how can you know that someone's teaching you another gospel? Parents must teach your children the simple Baltimore Catechism. We must know that there are ten commandments, that there are seven sacraments, that there are six precepts of the church. We must know there are seven gifts of the Holy Ghost, that there are seven virtues, three theological and four, and four cardinal, and all the virtues hang upon these. We must know the corporal and spiritual works of mercy. We must know the ten commandments. We must know these things, and then we know them simply as they're memorized in the simple catechism. St. Pius X would always teach the simple catechism all the way up until he became Pope. And then he said the catechism, he wrote 10 encyclicals. In his, he was Pope of 1903 to 1914. And he wrote 10 different encyclicals and documents and bulls and motu proprios on catechism, catechism, and catechism. We must know the gospel that we have received from Jesus Christ. Are we hearing a different gospel? Are they telling us there's salvation outside the Catholic Church? That's different. Therefore, let it be an aftermath. Notice also that St. Paul says, hold to the traditions, hold to the faith, hold to the truth. And when St. Paul died, what did he say? Tradidi quodera chepi. Imagine how he said those words. I have handed down what I have received, and the grace of God has not been fruitless in me. It has not been void. He handed out what he received. He received the truth from Jesus Christ himself, from God made man himself, who spent three years with him in the desert in Felix Arabia. It says here Arabia. Indians always dispute that word, those Indian Catholics. Felix Arabia is what it says, it originally said in the Greek, 
Felix Arabia, which means Happy Arabia, which happens to be eastern of east of Arabia. We have a Paul, we have a St. Paul cross where I used to say Mass in Visay, India, which is near Bombay. And the cross, the cross is set there for 2,000 years. The cross has been kept protected, and the cross is about 10 feet below the road level. So the entire, they kept the cross there for 2,000 years. And meanwhile, the whole area is built up by erosion and construction all around it. So now the cross, instead of being at the crossroad, it's down below, about 10 feet below the surface. You can still see the cross, and they kept it all protected. And it's called the Cross of St. Paul, that where he was spent three years with Jesus Christ in Felix Arabia, Happy Arabia, to the east side of Arabia, in the northern part of India, near Bombay. We used to say Mass about five minutes from that place. And so that there, there is the Felix Arabia, the, the place of St. Paul. St. Bartholomew passed by there and preached. St. Saint, Saint Paul was there alone. And so in any case, we have that that St. That Paul went to Arabia for three years. There he learned from Christ the gospel, and he handed down that gospel, and he did not make any adjustments to it. The error we're dealing with is Protestantism. And Protestantism is a very grave heresy. And the heresy of Protestantism has many wicked sides, one of which is the church has become purely personal and not doctrinal. If you go to a Protestant church, and Father Bob, or Pastor Bob, is not a likable pastor, you throw him out and get a new pastor. But St. Paul says, as St. Athanasius, repeating St. Paul, said, they have the churches, we have the faith. So when that priest and that bishop, who were originally Catholic priests and Catholic bishops back in the 300s, when that Catholic priest and Catholic bishop started preaching heresy, they said, leave the church, let it be anathema, and go out and have mass in your houses and have mass in the catacombs once again. We had catacombs because they attacked our bodies in the first 300 years, and now we have catacombs because they're attacking our minds and they're attacking our hearts in the next 100 years, in the time of the great crisis of the, of the Arians, heretics, and the Nestorians and others. In the Eastern world, Catholics have had to hide and have Mass in private for a long time, for the whole period of the last 2,000 years. So St. Paul says that, we, that the, if you hear another gospel, that is a twisting and changing of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He allowed there to be a wicked Judas. He allowed there to be St. Peter falling three times. And when St. Peter's third fall... Don't forget what his fall was. St. Peter was asked, Are you one of his disciples? And he said, I he cursed and he swore, I do not know the man. He denied the divinity of Jesus Christ. He who said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. When he said that, he spoke as Pope. He spoke as Peter. And a year and a half later, he said, I do not know the man. When he said that, he spoke as Simon in his weakness. And Christ did not fire him. He did not remove him from the papacy. But when that same Simon Peter, even though he was already a saint, when he decided to, to, to be nice to the Judaizers and endanger the faith of Catholics throughout the world, who would mix the New and Old Testament together, St. Paul came to St. Peter and he resisted him to the face. And he said to St. Peter, you are teaching something wrong. Change. And St. Peter, by the Holy Ghost, said, and I resisted Peter to the face because he was to be blamed. One of the much spilt ink over passages in sacred scripture because St. Peter was not capable of committing a deliberate venial sin. He was confirming grace. But nonetheless, he made some kind of mistake. I, 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 I resist him the faith because he was to be blamed. Because he allowed the church to endanger its faith from the very beginning. And the Pope can't allow that. So we already see in the history of the church what to do when there is a false doctrine. Let it be anathema. Be cut off from it. We don't remove them from their office. We don't take away their dignity. 
For what God is doing together, let God put asunder. God makes popes. God will remove popes. It is for God to do that, not us. What God has joined together, let, let no man put asunder. Not just the marriage, which is temporary only until death, but the priesthood is eternal. The papacy is until death. God will remove it in his own time. But meanwhile, we stand firm for the holy faith, and we don't play games with that holy faith, and we recognize the reality of our faith. It is a real faith, it is a true faith, it is an unchanging faith, and this faith is the one that we must put, put persevere in right now. We have a crisis in the church right now, and the conservative movement, which is mixing truth with lies, is not the answer. There is only the truth that is the answer, only the true faith and nothing else. What gets out therefore, you say that, uh, that as St. Paul, he received his faith from God, and this faith we must persevere in. What well, if an angel from heaven teaches you something different than what I've already taught you, let it be anathema. We know that there shall be popes until the end of time, and there will be wicked. some will be wicked, but some will be good. We know that there will be a faithful bishop and faithful priest until the end of time. But many will be wicked, and there will be ages when they all seem to be wicked. We know there will be some faithful uh, layperson until the end of time, even though many shall be wicked. We know that the truth shall persevere in every generation. We know that the truth never changes, and that the gospel is known to us. But as many saints point out, concerning the second verse about if an angel will teach you something different, again I say to you, if you hear, if you hear someone preach a gospel, different than the one that you have already received. What is the great wickedness of the world today in the Catholic Church? They want to make sure that no one even receives the gospel. So the modern Catholic, he was baptized, but so are Protestants baptized. Valid baptism, so is a Protestant baptism valid. So is an Orthodox baptism valid. But they're not Catholics. They don't know the faith. They've never received the faith. They must receive the faith. Take that faith which you have received, and then you can recognize when there's another one. We have people looking for the truth, but they never received it. Why did they never receive it? Because they weren't taught their simple catechism when they were children. They weren't made to memorize who made you. God made me. Why did God make you? God made me to know him, to, to show forth his goodness, and to know him, love him, and serve him in this world, so that I might be happy with him in the next. What do we mean when we say the Catholic Church is one? When we say the Catholic Church is one, we mean that as one faith, one set of sacraments, one sacrifice, united under one head, who is the Pope. Now, if you don't know these catechism answers, how can you know when you hear something different? What is the matter and form of the sacrament of baptism? What is, what is required to make a good confession? The five things teach a child to make a good confession. Little bitty children's catechism. I must find out my sins. I must be sorry for my sins. I must make up my mind not to sin again. I must tell my sins to the priest and do the penance the priest offers, tells me. Five things a seven-year-old can learn. We're teaching moral theology to the seminarians. We're teaching dogmatic theology. The five things don't change. you still got to find out your sins. you still got to make your mind not to sin again. You got to tell your sins to the priest. Do the penance the priest tells you, and 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 we have to do all the five things. Find out my sins. Be sorry for my sins. Tell my sins to the priest. Make up my mind not to sin again. Do the penance the priest tells me. All five things must be done, and it hasn't changed. How do we teach people to make up their mind not to sin again? Well, they're going to grow in virtue. We got to build the love of God inside the soul. But if we don't know the faith that catechism given to us, if I don't know the faith I've received, how can I recognize that there's a different one given to me? Know the simple catechism. Recognize when there's something different being given. Let them be anathema. Let them be anathema simply means that. It means be condemned. It actually literally means exactly what we say in daily speech. We tell someone to go to hell. Doesn't mean you want them to go to hell. It means to have nothing to do with you. You forget it. I'm not listening to you. Get lost. Let it be anathema is the same expression. That's what it means literally. It means go to hell. And so the fact is that we, we, we are standing firm for our faith. 
We don't take changes in our faith. We recognize the reality. And so we pray for our, God, our country, which is now in a greater state of wickedness than it ever has been. The United States of America, as a democracy and republic, is dead. We are now, as of January the 20th, a communist state, visible, and straightforward, pure communist state. That's what we are. It's no longer... It can be called a republic. It can no longer be called a democracy. It is now a communist state run by a dictator ruled by communist principles who put ten cabinet members. All ten cabinet members happen to be dual citizens. Now there are a lot of countries in the world. I think there's at least 300 countries. And there's a lot of options to be a dual citizen of. But the cabinet advisors of, Pope, of, of uh, President Biden are all of them dual citizens of the country of the United States, being one of the countries, and the country of Israel being the other country. All ten of them are citizens of Israel. And what advice are they going to give? Is it going to be for the good of the country? No. It's going to be for the good of the spread of Satanism, the good for the spread of the rule of the Antichrist to come, the good for the spread of communism more and more throughout our country. And this is not the first time that we've had wicked men in charge of our lands where Catholics dwell. We have dwelled in catacombs before. We have dwelled in prison camps before. We have dwelled in persecution before. And our faith survives all the wicked persecutors. And, the, and remember, as we mentioned last week or recently, Remember what it says to St. When the angel appeared to St. Joseph in Egypt, he said to him, You may now return to Nazareth, because all of those who sought to kill the child are dead. Every single man that seeks to kill Jesus Christ shall hear the same words and shall have the same experience. They are all going to be dead. Their time is not forever. Their time shall pass. But if we stay faithful to that faith given to us as it was given to us, our time is forever. And there will be moments of difficulties, moments of persecution, but we shall have the victory in the end. So we pray for our country, we pray for our church, and we pray to imitate the greatness of our ancestors of the faith, who stood firm in the faith against all adversity, and remain faithful unto the end, and now are glorified, and live happily in the face-to-face -face with God, and the angels, and the saints, and the Holy Mother. We bless you all, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.